program is brought to you by GDF Suez. Yes, seven days, four Paris Space correspondents, one hour. The World This Week, in partnership with the International Herald Tribune and uh, holding chair, Matthew Saltmarsh, how are you? Very good, thanks. Good evening. All right. Um, he's the managing editor of World Politics Review. Welcome back, Judah Grunstein. Also joining us, uh, freelance reporter and photojournalist Michael Kirtley and uh, freelance news columnist Celestine Bowen. News columnist, news reporter. Well, both. <laughs> okay. I've been both. The World This Week, by the way, which you can follow on Facebook. A little bit uh, later on, we'll be uh, reading some of your comments uh, from the past week. There's the page. Um, and uh, there's a Celestine's picture and everyone else's. Uh, yeah, let's get on now, though, to our first uh, topic. And uh, we're going to talk about belt tightening. We're going to talk about sacrifice. We're going to talk about austerity. We're going to talk about the lush forests north of Toronto and the exclusive lakeside resort of Huntsville, venue for the Group of Eight Summit. Yes, there you see it. Um, this is where they're going to be talking about belt tightening. Itself uh, the prelude for the Toronto G20 summit. Um, would you say, Matthew Salmers, a bit of cognitive dissonance between uh, what's uh, on the agenda and where they're discussing it? Certainly seems that way. I mean, I know there's been a big controversy uh, in Canada among the population about the amount of money that's been spent uh, mainly on security, although there was particularly... Uh, I've seen figures of 1.1 billion Canadian dollars. That's a lot of money. It's a huge operation having the leaders of the 20 largest economies, obviously, uh, in, in, your, in your home, and the security operation is very expensive, and streets have to be cleared, hotels are cleared, and so on. There was also a bit of controversy over an artificial lake that was created in uh, Toronto, I believe, that uh, the locals thought was a little bit too opulent for uh, these austere times. Yeah. Anyway, that, so, there's, uh, so it's taking place in a nice setting, and, uh, but unfortunately the forecast, not the weather forecast, but the political forecast um, is dicey at best. Uh, David Cameron ahead of his first world summit, the new British Prime Minister, warning against uh, a great expectations at the G20. He granted an interview uh, to the uh, Toronto Globe and Mail uh, where he, he said as much. And uh, Judah Grunstein, you have the feeling uh, when, these, when, when the G20 first happened, in the middle of the, this economic crisis, you, th this was uh, quite an exciting concept. You had the, the old G8 plus all these emerging nations. This was going to perhaps rewrite the rules on how people get along and everything. And now, are, are, is it sort of getting into sort of a routine? Well, I think it's probably maybe not so much a routine, but the, the, the changing circumstances. I mean, at the beginning, the G20 was, was summoned and gathered uh, when the crisis, uh, the financial crisis was at its height, there was a real sense of panic and a real need for everyone to get on the same page. Um, as that's receded, uh, some of the, the divergences in interests have, have come out. Um, and I think that uh, uh, there's, there are a lot of parallels to be made to the European Union, for instance, where consensus is very hard to come by because uh, nation states have different uh, have different interests and different uh, concerns right now. I think we're seeing the the most uh, dramatic divergences being between um, the United States uh, and most of the stateside uh, analysts calling for uh, continued stimulus spending and uh, the the wave of austerity budgets that's uh, sweeping through Europe. So, Stephen Bullen, it's interesting because uh, you really have the impression it's the U.S. versus Europe, more specifically, the U.S. versus you could say Germany. That's true. I mean, you know, there's, you know, it's, as uh, Judy was just saying, there have been a lot of the talking heads have been hammering at each other um, uh, you know, in both sides of the Atlantic. And then when you read the ministers, they say, no, 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 our, our quarrels are actually under control. We just have differences of cultures and history and, and different approach. I have to say that, um, you know, I think as a bystander, I mean, I'm not an economist. I, I myself am sort of not on one side or the other because each one makes a compelling case. I mean, the Germans say, you know, we are not actually going overboard. We're just sort of tightening up. And this is our, you know, we have a population that is really allergic to <coughs> big debt. Um, and, um, you know, we can do both growth and tighten belt. I, you know, it seems to me that there's a, you know, that, that there's a sort of a, 
academic argument in the air with a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to really happen on the ground. And also, I mean, to what extent is this, you know, turning into a little boxing match to just keep interest in the in the summit, you know, in the press, basically. I mean, well, what's interesting also to note is uh, the difference uh, several weeks have made for the German chancellor. Um, a few weeks ago, she uh, was uh, seen as politically on the ropes, uh, newspapers uh, in her country speculating about a possible collapse of the ruling coalition. Uh, but uh, Germany, since drawing a line in the sand, let's listen to Angela Merkel when it comes to belt tightening. I don't believe that we will all be of one opinion. I have to say this fairly. But as Europeans, we will be able to say clearly, in Germany in particular, that we are of the opinion that the financial market participants should also be involved in the costs of the crisis. I would prefer a clear answer to no answer. Michael Kirtley, we've sort of discovered a new Angela Merkel these past couple of uh, ever since the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the ever since the the last election where uh, the Grand Coalition was replaced by a coalition of uh, conservatives and uh, uh, the uh, uh, FDP. Well, yes, she's taken on more of a you know a stronger role, obviously a different a different agenda. But I think also it's this big. As, as, as Celestine was saying, this big thing about between the United States and Germany, the big bow. But you have to ask yourself: Is this all worth it? Is this is 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 this is this G20 still a valid concern now? Considering that uh, I think Cameron was saying that it was basically uh, you know people getting together in a salon to to just shoot the shit, you know. So I don't know. You know, for me, it seems to me that we have a situation where the world is stable in its in its need for just figuring out the future in a way that's new. And this is going to happen. Matthew Selmarsh, when you're with uh, the pack of financial reporters covering the, uh, covering the European Union summits and cutting out, and when you look at this, what do you get out of a summit like this one beyond the jousting we see between world leaders and the interpretation of sentences that say, let's call for more stimulus, let's, let's call for more belt tightening? You tend to get very, very little in the end. You wait around for two or three days speculating on what, what, who said what and who's had what meetings and what's going to go into the communique. And then nine times out of ten you get a very bland document saying we will try our best to improve the situation in the world and to foster growth as best we can while keeping in mind budget deficits. Is there a real problem between the U.S. and Germany right now? No, I don't think so. I think they're just taking a slightly different approach towards the end of this current downturn. The Americans feel that... You need to throw a lot more at it. You need to keep stimulating the economy on the fiscal side. And, and as was mentioned earlier, the, the Germans have a slightly different view on that. And they feel that to actually get through and, and to get growth back, it's actually better to try and balance your books and to, to get the state. Their argument is that, that the citizens are, are more confident if the state, if they know that they're going to have to pay less tax in future. So it's just a slightly different nuance of an economic argument, but uh, I don't think it's a fundamental rift here. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'd agree. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that, uh, I th and I think both the the importance of the summit, uh, I think, comes through in in the open letter that Obama sent, sort of to the to the world leaders, where he talked about the need to to harmonize national economies with the needs of the global economy, and so I think that what what you have right now is this this realization that. Uh, the, the process of globalization, uh, economic globalization, has gone to such a degree that there's no there's no more thing there's no more there's there, it, it's no longer true that you can think nationally. You have to think uh, globally. And uh, and really, what, what Obama was calling out, not just Germany but also China, he he mentioned export driven economies that are that are not doing enough to drive domestic demand. Um, so I think that. Uh, there, there are these. There are certain cleavages which have to do with uh, financial regulation and, and the bank, bank tax. And I would, I would agree that those are a, a question of timing and and uh, and, and and nuance. Uh, but when it comes to this question of, of stimulus versus austerity, I think uh, uh, not being enough of an economist to know, or not being an economist at all to know how dramatic the, the, the consequences will be. Philosophically, I think it is a very different approach. I think that uh, uh, there's this sense that, uh, that Germany and China in particular are, 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 are not doing enough to spread the wealth. And not doing enough. Mm -hmm. Let's listen to billionaire investor George Soros. He goes further than the U.S. administration. 
He's bluntly accusing the Germans of, quote, endangering the EU. Germany can't be blamed for wanting a strong currency and a balanced budget, but it can be blamed for Im imposing its predilection on other countries that have different needs, like Procrustes, who forced other people to lie in his bed and stretch them or cut off their legs to make them fit. The Procrustes bed inflicted on the Eurozone is called deflation. Celestine Bolin, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the problem is uh, when we talk about the, uh, looking at a kind of an economic model for the world, you know, we only have to start with the European to realize how difficult it is, you know, to get different countries to sacrifice their own sort of national agendas, national kind of commitments. And I think the, the German one is the, is the case in point, um, and it's certainly at the center of the attention because of this historical allergy to debt. But, I, you know, another point, just I was reading the other day that Scherbel made a, the finance minister had an interview. The German finance minister. Yeah, pointing out that, um, you know, there's a there's a different demographic at work, for instance. I mean, you know, that, that basically German is, Germany is looking at a kind of an aging population, a shrinking population. Where will the money come to sustain the debt, to pay for the debt? The United States is in another situation, so still a growing population with a kind of a an economy that's able to produce growth in part because of this population and immigration and so on, you know, so that they're, you know, it's not just that their solutions um, follow different models. They themselves, these countries and their economies, exist in sort of different um, sort of, you know, not universes, but I mean different, they, 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 are, they operate on different um, models, basically. Where does uh, your native UK fit in in all this? Beginning of the week, uh, the uh, uh, new uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, unveiling uh, belt tightening the likes of which Britain hasn't seen since the war. Yeah, well, certainly it's reminded a lot of people of the early Thatcherite austerity. Um, and it's quite a surprising, not surprising, but it's quite a big U-turn for, for Britain, which was much more along the American lines of having strong stimulus spending, consumer-driven economy. Um, it went through much the same economic cycle as the U.S. did in the sort of 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Now they're veering away from the American model very much so, and, and they're going much more towards the German, <clears throat> the German model by saying, you know, we really need to tighten our belts, we really need to, to start saving money and to put taxes up and to, to pay for the future. So that's probably one of the most interesting kind of divergence that we've seen in terms of, of economic models. Whether it's actually going to be the solution, I don't think anyone can say at the moment, whether it's going to bring growth back, um, you know, remains to be seen. No, it's a problem, isn't it? You don't know where, where growth is, is, is going to go. And one of the things that keep cropping up in my mind when we talk about the G20 is, and the G8 is, What's going to happen to the third world in all of this? Uh, as you know, there are observers from both Africa and from Asia and, and some from South America that are there that are not part of the, of the committee. But uh, it, it seems to me that all this belt tightening has an amend a, a tremendous effect on how the rest of the world is, is looking at what's going on. And it seems to me also that the, that the deciders that are going to be at the G20 have a very little interest in worrying about that. They're very interested in their local politics today. Whereas before in the past, they've, they've been interested in other politics. I was just going to say also that uh, uh, part of the, the argument going on is, is a little premature because a lot of these austerity budgets are going to be gradually... Take years uh, to come through. Uh, exactly. So uh, the, the idea that suddenly... Uh, Germany and, and uh, Great Britain. It's and screeching uh, halt. It's not, yeah. it's not, it's, right. it's inaccurate. And that, that's why I feel that there's a little bit of a kind of an academic debate going on. I mean, and again, when you listen to the ministers, they say it's not quite as shrill and as black and white as this, you know, this uh, debate makes it out to be. And I, I suspect that's true. But you know, I think when people start talking about invoking the Great Depression and saying this is the way, you know, which is what's happened, people are saying that belt tightening is exactly what happened in the 30s in major economies and, and led to the Great Depression. It's no wonder that we're all riveted by this debate, real or not, you know, I guess is... Mm. We're going we're gonna to move on now and discuss uh, what you could call the boys will be boys department. It all begins with a recent 
boozy night at an Irish bar on Paris's right bank, which uh, this week resulted in the firing of NATO's top commander. Loose lips from General Stanley McChrystal and his closest aides, heaping scorn uh, on that fateful evening in the French capital on many in the White House inner circle, fatefully transcribed by Rolling Stone magazine, resulting in his firing. Barack Obama reminding one and all that he is the commander-in-chief. difficult as it is to lose General McChrystal, I believe that it is the right decision for our national security. The conduct represented in the recently published article does not meet the standard that should be set by a commanding general. It undermines the civilian control of the military that is at the core of our democratic system. And it erodes the trust that's necessary for our team to work together to achieve our objectives in Afghanistan. Judah Grunstein, uh, mil mil the military, they are always in private going to slag off the suits the same way <coughs> in any office uh, you'll uh, slag off the other department, perhaps. New the news team might slag off sales or whatever <laughs> if you're in any news organization. Was, they, was, was General McChrystal really undermining Barack Obama's authority? Um, let me let me sort of answer a different question. Uh, he, <laughs> he had to be fired. There was absolutely no question about it. Even if in the 36 hours that it took for the decision to be made, uh, there was this this question of who, what what impact would that have on the Afghanistan war? Uh, the the idea that he could not only tolerate but bathe in that kind of uh, environment. Uh, in his inner circle uh, is unacceptable in the military. And, and, and what's interesting is that most of the military uh, commenters and commentators were the most adamant about it because they know that, uh, that angry a general... That, angry that General McChrystal said those things no, or angry adamant, that he let them get out? Adamant about the fact that he needed to be fired because that undermines the command chain up and down the line. What, what he did is not just compromise his relationship to the commander-in-chief. He compromised the relationship of a captain to his lieutenants, of colonels to their, to, to their subordinates. Uh, so the, 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 whole co the whole chain of command depends on mm. a respect for the chain of command. And so uh, beyond the fact that uh, it was just an incredibly, shockingly uh, uh, stupid lapse in judgment, uh, to, to allow that kind of behavior around a reporter. So I think he compromised, or I, I, I believe he compromised his position to the point where there was really no other response that could have, uh, that could have, that President Obama could have uh, Very given. quickly, because we're going to have to go to a break. Celestine so, Bowen, stupidity or a provocation on the part of McChrystal? Um, I, I was just struck by the headline on the piece, which I actually hadn't seen. I've seen it quoted all over the place, but I hadn't seen it. The Runaway General. I mean, I think it's... I mean, maybe it's something in between, you know, in the sense that this is in character uh, for him. There's a kind of special ops quality to the guy, you know, you know, sort of likes to tell it like it is. And, you know, obviously, uh, so, I mean, what, did, was it deliberate? Probably not. Was it stupid? Very definitely. Um, and, uh, but was it in character? I would say also uh, it's not a surprise, probably, you know, for people who know him. All right. We're going to look at what it all means, of course, uh, for the conflict in Afghanistan and uh, for NATO's efforts there. After the break, stay with us. The World This Week continues. From a ship that it's claimed has the capacity to clean up the catastrophe currently licking Louisiana's shores, Join us for Environment when we'll be looking at the chaotic cleanup efforts off the Gulf Coast. Don't miss Environment, Saturday, 11.40 a.m. Paris time on France 24.